Now would you please stand as we read, if you can, uh, our scripture reading out of Nehemiah 2, 17 through 20. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruin, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king has said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work, but when Symbalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Jessam the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We as servants will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Amen. And you may be seated. And if you would, once again, join me in prayer this morning. So Father, we just thank you that your presence and your spirit is here among us. And we just ask that you would allow your church to be faithful. I pray specifically for my sisters and brothers at First Pres, just up the road, as they continue to search for a pastor. I pray that you would bring the right person to the job so that they can shepherd that congregation that is so vital in our community. And for those of us here this morning, I just ask that you'd allow our ears to be open and our hearts to be softened. And personally, I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to your Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It's been a stressful couple of weeks for those of us up here in Rudoso, hasn't it? Anybody else feel stressed the last couple of weeks? <laughs> Thou shalt not lie to your pastor. <laughs> it's the 11th commandment. Stress does a lot of things to our bodies, Um, and it's not just humans' bodies that stress causes to affect. Did you know that stress actually affects cows, and it can decrease their milk? It's an utter disaster. (laughs) Well, if they stop producing altogether their milk duds, right? (laughs) I've milked it for all it's worth, haven't I? I didn't have to look for it, buddy. It just comes to me naturally, man. (laughs) You can ask my wife. It does. In fact, in Sunday school, this is just like a brief little aside. Um, Some of our people brought us plates that were animal-shaped, and mine was actually shaped like a cow. I was going to bring it, but it got blue donut all over it. So what's happening here in Nehemiah, besides me just making our um, lay leaders pronounce all these crazy names, is is we remember last week, Nehemiah, um, a man who had been exiled, a man who had watched his people face devastation, he sat down and he wept and fasted for days. And that's how I left the service, right? During a time such as this, um, it's okay for us to be sad. It's okay for us to feel pain and sorrow. Um, But what God calls us is he wants us to stay there for a certain time. But at some point, he wants us to get up and to do something about it. And so as Nehemiah is going on, um, we find out a couple of things about who Nehemiah is. Nehemiah is a person who was a cupbearer to the king. Um, Any of y'all been a cupbearer to the king before? So think of it like this. They were the king's taste tester. They made sure that what the king ate and drank was not poisoned. So it was a pretty important role. Um, In fact, when we were over in Africa, um, man, in 2007, it's been a few years since we've been there, um, the bishops had tasters because some of the bishops were afraid they'd get poisoned so somebody else could become the bishop. It was pretty crazy. Um, So this man, Nehemiah, had become pretty trusted by the king. He was kind of his right-hand man, a guy that would make sure that the king was taken care of. And so as the story of Nehemiah 1 and 2 progresses before we get to the text today, um, Nehemiah walks in with the food to give to the king, and obviously um, Nehemiah is a little sad. He's been weeping and mourning and fasting for days. And all you have to do is kind of walk around the community, right? And you can see a few sad faces, 
And the king is pretty observant. It's King Artaxerxes. You can actually look for him. He was a king of the Babylonian Empire. Um, I didn't do all full nerdy this week and tell you what dates he reigned, but um, Artaxerxes looks at Nehemiah and he says, why are you so sad? And Nehemiah, before he even responds, he says, I went to God in prayer and just said a quick little prayer, right? Your prayers don't have to be long, drawn-out things. They can be simple breath prayers. Lord, help me. Lord, give me the words. Lord, give me the ears. Nehemiah prayed, and he says, well, look, the reason I'm sad is because, remember, your predecessors, they went into my land, they destroyed it, they annihilated it, they burned it down, the city's in ruins, my people are dying still. And the king looked at him and said, well, what do you expect me to do about it? And Nehemiah, instead of saying, oh, nothing, I'm good, right? None of us have said that in the last couple of weeks. Man, I'm so great. Life is just peachy keen here, <sighs> except it's not. Nehemiah knew he had an opportunity, and so he did what every great employee wants to do. He said, King, if I could just have a few weeks off, and let me go back home and check on my friends and family there. And the king looks at the queen and says, you know what, he's been a good person. Let's send him back home. But Nehemiah doesn't stop with asking for a few weeks' page time off. He says, in fact, when you send me home, I know that that land is still in turmoil, right? Just like Israel is still in turmoil today. So since it's in turmoil, what I need you to do is I need you to write me a letter. I want you to seal it so that I can get safe passage to home. Right? He had his passport and his visa stamped by the king. And the king says, yeah, I think I can do that too. And he said, well, so king, by the way, while you're at it, since you're writing me that letter, if you could go ahead and get me some timber from some people that used to be our enemy so we could start rebuilding the walls, and if you'd let me have a little bit longer so I can help rebuild the city, that'd be great too. And the king's like, sure, I guess so. Why not? Now, I think like if any of my employees came up and asked me that, hey, Dustin, you know, a tornado hit Texas, can I go home? And we're, it's like, well... I think I, as like a pastor, I would do that, but the ruler of a nation that's looking out for themselves, that's, yeah, we all know our government, right? Just saying. And this is what Artaxerxes does. He grants him his request. He allows him safe passage. Nehemiah starts going home. He starts rebuilding. And as he's rebuilding, people come up and start opposing him. Verse 19 says it great. I'm going to skip the names that Murray so miraculously pronounced this morning. <laughs> and just listen to these words. These people mocked and ridiculed us. Have you ever been doing something and been mocked and ridiculed while you're doing it? It's not very fun, is it? And so this is a man that's been called by God on a mission by God to do something that is amazing to help rebuild the city of God and the temple of God, and he's being mocked and ridiculed. And it's almost like, what's happening to us? Is God, as a congregation, is calling us to help in the rebuilding efforts, and there are people that want to mock and ridicule us. Now, it may not be like a physical person. It may be your insurance agent, adjuster who tells you that, hey, by the way, um, your, all your stuff is depreciated and we can give you 10% of what you actually think it's worth. I heard that story this week. That's just great news, isn't it? It could be FEMA and the government not acting as quickly as we thought or hoped they would, which, by the way, FEMA was here today, left some stuff on the door. I'd encourage you to read it. They encourage everybody to fill out a claim. That's the government for you. It could be just the floods that happened. And after last week, and I preached about mourning and fasting, and I said, I don't know if y'all remember my very last word from last week. Y'all don't remember it, do you? I said, tomorrow we rebuild. We, I had people come into my office on Monday morning and said, Dustin, we can't rebuild today. We still need to mourn and fast because of what happened with the flooding on Sunday night. But man, praise be to God, we haven't had a natural disaster in six days, right? <laughs> Like, good news, a great joy. And it's like what happens as we're trying to be faithful stewards of God and we're trying to be faithful to him and we're trying to rebuild and we're trying to help people and then we get kicked down because people ridicule and mock us 
And it's just like kicking a person while it's down. And I think sometimes we actually do it to ourselves by what we tell each other or things that we say. And so I just want to go over a few Christian cliches that have been said to me in the last two weeks and tell you why they're wrong. Is that okay? How many people have said something like this? God won't give you more than you can handle. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no, don't clap for that. I'll tell you why not to clap for that. It's based off of a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that says that God won't tempt you beyond measure. So it's saying that God's not going to tempt you, but it doesn't say God won't give you more than you can handle because let's be honest, we've had a lot on our plates as a community the last two weeks. Yes. Because I can't handle it. I need strength and support and security from an outside source. I know that um, if it was by my own efforts, I would have already called my bosses back in Texas and said, hey, assign me to a nice little country church where they just have tornadoes instead, right? (laughs) And Murray, I did say that about the locusts, but let me, one of my friends assured me that all I have to do is find a sacrificial lamb, smear the blood on my doorpost, and my kid will still be safe after that. So anybody have any lambs later, we might be looking for it. God will give us more than we can handle. The situations are too stressful, too taxing, too trying for us to stand alone. That's why we have to rely upon him and we have to rely upon one another. Because at the end of the day, um, as good and great and as strong as I like to think I am, you can ask my wife, I'm not. We need help. And we need help from God. Another one of those Christian cliches during a time like this is, well, it was just God's plan. Oh, no, I've heard that said to me in the last couple of weeks, too. (laughs) God wanted this to happen to us. I don't know the way you understand God, but let me tell you, the God that I know, the God that I understand in the Bible is a loving, gracious, compassionate God. He never plans for pain or death or destruction. In fact, those are things that are all attributed in the Gospel of John to the evil one, to the slander, to the devil. Death, disease, disaster are all his. What God longs is for his people to live in perfect communion with us. And his plan for the whole time was for God to come into a broken world and relieve that pain and suffering by giving us his spirit. That's God's plans for us. He does have a plan, but it is not one of death and destruction. It is one of revival, of renewal, and of resurrection. Something else that was said to me is, well, you just need more faith. And that's always nice to know that your pastor needs more faith, isn't it? But it's true. Um, One of my favorite songs when I was a teenager by Cademan's Call said, had the lyrics, my faith is like shifting sand, changed by every wave. And I think my faith is a little stronger than that now. Um, what does it say if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain? I'm telling you, I mean, I asked for mountains to be moved. I'm still sitting there. I've asked for dead bodies to be raised, and they're still dead. I've asked for sick people to be healed, and they were never healed. I wish I had more faith, but that's why I think my favorite prayer in the Bible is from the ninth chapter of Mark. I do believe God, but help my unbelief, right? Because doubt is a natural part of Christianity. When you see massive pain and destruction and suffering on a scale such as we have, it's natural to be like, really? Is this who you are, God? Is this what you want? So let's just keep praying, I do believe, but help my unbelief. And the worst one, I haven't heard it in the last couple of weeks, but I've heard it as a pastor. And in fact, somebody asked me, well, I guess I did hear it because somebody asked me about it on Monday. They said, well, do you think that the reason this happened is God is just punishing us for our sin? No, that's absolutely ridiculous. That's kicking a good man down. And I've had to sit with teenagers that felt guilty for their grandparents passing away because people had told them if they had more faith, their grandparents would still be alive. 
I've had to deal with congregation members who were in the hospital who were told the reason they were there is because they were sinful and they needed to repent and confess and God would heal them. Our God does not punish people because of our past or previous sins. As Jesus says, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. What God does is he gets our attention and he longs for us to come back to him. And man, I've got a, like my confession and my fear is, and a couple of y'all talked to me about this. Do you remember the very last sermon I preached before the fire was about coveting and how we have too much stuff? Talk about pastor's guilt. Right? It's like, I didn't mean it like that, Jesus. Like you can get our attention in a different way. God doesn't punish us. Think about all the things that we've heard over the last two weeks and how they've impacted us. And something I want you to hear this morning is the way that I um, end every email that I send out. And this is how you know if it's an email for me or not. Okay, church? Best of all, God is with us. And so this is a liturgy I've tried teaching y'all a couple of times, but I know it's been a few years since I've said it, so I've made slides so you can pay attention to it. I say the part in black, and you say this slide. So let's try it again, really. Best of all, let's try it a little bit better. Best of all, think about everything that we've heard. Think about everything we've gone through. Think about everything you've experienced in the best last two weeks. The best news of all is that God has never left us. God has never forsaked us. And God is there every single step of the way. In the midst of the highs, in the midst of the joys, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the sorrow, God is there walking along with you. And he knows what is going on in your life. He knows that we long to rebuild. He knows that the city lies in ruins, but he cares for each and every one of us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And um, I want us to rest assured in the words of the prophet Amos, a different Old Testament prophet that actually came before Nehemiah's time. In Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, this is what Amos promises for the future of Israel. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. I will rebuild as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And that all the nations will bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do all of these things. You see, Amos, was a time, um, Amos prophesied in a time when there was a false king, and he was saying that if Israel doesn't turn away, if Judah doesn't turn away, they're going to come and be destroyed. And he says, but you know what? After the desolation, after the demolition of the papal, I'm going to come back. God is going to send somebody, and they are going to rebuild the people. And this is exactly the call that Nehemiah has on his life is that despite the devastation that is facing around him, is that God is with him and his God is calling him to rebuild. And in the midst of it all, people are standing there mocking him and ridiculing him, causing him to doubt and to question and to fear. And the reality is, I think all of us during this time have had doubts and fears and questions. I've got to be honest, as a pastor, um, I'm wondering how it's going to impact the community and the church long term. I've already had one family that I know that's moved away because of the fire, another several that have said in the future they're probably going to look at moving. And what does that do for us as a congregation? What does it do when the community can't rebuild because there's massive floodplains and people just decide to stay in Roswell or Tula Rosa or somewhere else? What are the long-term impacts? I don't know. And while I wish um, I could rest assured that God will um, be with us as we rebuild, um, and that's honestly where I was going. Uh, I've said that a few times. That's where we're going. That's where I was going to go in the sermon is what Nehemiah says in verse 20. He says, I answered them saying that God of heaven will give us success as we rebuild or with his servants will start to rebuild. And that's where I want us to go is that God will give us success But the reality is, I don't know what that success is going to look like as far as rebuilding the physical aspect of our city. Talking to some of our city leaders, there are new floodplains that are created that people may not be actually able to live in. But what God calls us to rebuild as a church isn't something that's just physical, even though we're doing that, church. I mean, I want to thank some of you that are out there doing that right now. They're in the community rebuilding, that have been in the community sandbagging, that have been in the community helping families there. I know who you are, and we appreciate you being the hands and feet of Christ. 
But I think um, what God calls the church, and I'm going to get really nerdy really fast, this word, ek kaleo, that's translated as church, the called out ones is what it means in Greek. What he's calling us to be as the people called out of by God is to rebuild a kingdom, not just a community. And it's not my kingdom, and it's not the Methodist kingdom, but it's the kingdom of God that rests on earth. And my hope and my prayer is we brought in a disaster specialist from Florida has told us is that a year from now, people will come to us and say, the fire was the best thing that happened to us because we found Christ and we found a community. You see, as we're called to rebuild, it's not just rebuilding something physical, but it's rebuilding something spiritual. It's allowing people to know that in Christ Jesus, they are never alone or forsaken. It's allowing them to know that they have an eternal home, even though this home may have been passed away. And it's allowing them to know that internally, inside, God gives us certain promises that we don't need to forget about. He promises in the midst of pain and devastation We can be a people of joy. In the midst of loss and tragedy, we can give thanks. That we can be filled with the Spirit. Be joyful always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God Jesus. God does not issue commands without the promise to fulfill it through his grace. We are called during this time to still be a people of eternal joy. But the reality is we have more than we can handle. We can't do it by ourselves. FEMA can't do it by themselves. State Farm can't do it by themselves. And even the Baptists can't do it by themselves. And and I'm so thankful for my Baptist sisters and brothers right now. They're doing so much good in our community. We have to fully rely and trust on who God is. And we have to think that the thing that the most important is rebuilding is not just a physical house, and while that is important, it is an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ that will truly make a difference in our people's lives. And so I hope that as we are the hands and feet of Christ, as we are rebuilding the walls of the city, that people will see and experience the goodness and the hope of who Jesus Christ is, that we don't just rebuild temporally, but we rebuild eternally, internally for lives will be changed. And I trust and I know and I believe that God has prepared us to be his people for such a time as this. That we are called to help rebuild and restore not just homes, but lives in Ruidoso. To be the people who are called out by God in the midst of ridicule, in the midst of criticism, so that we can know that God is always with us. So church, let us build the church and let us build the kingdom as we help rebuild Ruidoso. And God's going to give us success because best of all, let us pray. Father, we know that you are with us always and everywhere and we give you thanks and praise for that. And so I pray this morning as we continue into worship with you and as we feast on your body and your blood, that you would allow yourself to come and be a part of our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls. Fill us and overflow within us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. During the time of communion, I just want you to know it doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. We have an open table. We would love for you to participate in the body and blood of Christ with us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who dwell in charity with their neighbors, and who intend to live a holy life. So let us draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, making your humble confession to the Almighty God. Let us pray. Let's see if we can get it on the screens. Go to the prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, Yeah. (laughs) Almighty and most merciful God, we humbly, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry and we humbly repent because the remembrance of our sin is more than we can bear. Have mercy on us. Forgive us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, pardon us of all that is past and grant us we may serve you in the newness of life. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In his great mercy, our almighty God and heavenly Father has promised of forgiveness of our sins to all who repent and live in faith. May he have mercy upon us. May he pardon us and deliver us from our sins and confirm and strengthen in all of us the goodness by bringing us everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want you to hear these words of Jesus Christ our Savior as he says to all those who turn to him, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen? May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us extend the signs of peace to one another. So just say peace to your neighbor. All you have to do is turn around and say peace be with you. Peace, Pat. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our joy to give thanks to you in all places and at all times, Almighty Father, for you are the source of all truth, life, and love. You made us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When in our sinfulness we turned away from you and our love felled, your love has remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, you made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you called us to a new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, we praise you with the heavenly angels, the archangels, and all the company of heaven, forever singing the hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, count of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. For all praise and glory is yours, O God, our Father. For in your tender mercy, you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to the world. Your spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the year of the Lord's favor. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross. He offered himself up once and for all, so that by his suffering and death, we can be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. And now Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body, which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the supper was over, he took the cup of the new covenant. He poured out the wine, in our case juice, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this often in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of Christ Jesus that we come together to his table as we proclaim the mystery of the faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And we celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father. We ask that you receive the gifts of bread and juice, making them thanksgiving for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sanctify them by your word and the Holy Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and partake of his most blessed body and blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with your church. May dwell in us and we may dwell. So, Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that through your Son, to whom and with the Holy Spirit, your holy church and honor would be now and forever. Amen and amen. If those that are assisting would please come.